There is an old idea in economics that very few economists seem to know about, a rather subtle kind of theft that most people don't even notice is happening, despite the fact that the size of the theft is enormous. The poorest half of the population end up paying perhaps 10 or 20% of their income to rich people their entire lives for no good reason whatsoever. This video will explain the scam. The scam involves our crazy housing market, but before we proceed, we must clarify one thing about housing. The general public casually refer to the cost of buying a house as if the land were free and what we were paying for was the cost of bricks and mortar. This view is, however, mistaken. Consider the advertised price of a house located in the remote countryside and then compare that to an identical house in the middle of a major city like London. The difference could be as much as fivefold. And so it is with rent. If you rent a house or flat in a big city, then really your bill can be considered like this. The biggest part of the cost will be renting the land, and it's this component that is the basis of the scam. The next part of this explanation requires us to consider a little thought experiment. Imagine that in the distant past, a large ship ran into rocks off a desert island and started sinking. Everyone jumped overboard and started swimming towards the nearest beach. Unfortunately, a man armed with a gun reached the shore first, and then upon everyone else's arrival, he would point the gun at them and say, I got here first, so this island is mine. You can't live here unless you pay me rent for using my land. The swimmers have no choice and have to give the landowner part of their income for evermore. When I say income, that might be in terms of fish or coconuts or whatever it is they collect. This situation is obviously unjust. If you were one of the people having to pay rent, you'd no doubt be angry. You'd probably protest. Years go by and a simple economy develops on the island. People are making things from wood and stone, whilst others are fishing or hunting. Let us now imagine that one of the islanders becomes relatively rich, as rich as one can be on a desert island, perhaps because they invented some new tool or discovered some medicine. One day, the rich person approaches the now ageing man with the gun and says, you must be fed up with all the aggravation of collecting rent and having everyone complaining about you the whole time. How about you sell me the island and then you can retire? The man with the gun agrees. Some of the other islanders observe this transaction and are wondering what's going to happen next. The rich man then makes an announcement. For years you've all been paying rent to that thief who unjustly claimed this island, but I have now purchased this island with my own hard-earned money. I am now the rightful owner, so you can all pay rent to me and quit protesting. If you were an islander, would you be happy with the situation now? At this point, you may feel there is something strange going on. Normally, you don't begrudge ownership of items to people that have paid for them, but somehow this seems different. Why should you be paying anything at all for the privilege of living on the island? After all, none of the castaways should have any more claim to the land than any other. The resolution of this apparent paradox is as follows. The reason we have some innate feeling that the rich man does not deserve ownership, despite apparently having paid for it, is because the wrong people have received the payment. As a really simple example, consider two people, Bob and Sue, knitting a scarf. Say that they both knitted exactly half. Now imagine that while Sue was distracted, Bob sold it to a passerby and pocketed the entirety of the money. Clearly an unfair situation. What this illustrates is that the sale of something can only be fair so long as everyone with a claim to it is being compensated. So in the case of someone wanting to purchase land, a sale could only be said to be fair if everyone with a claim to the land was receiving a share of the purchase price. An additional complication in the case of land, and different to most items we think about buying or selling, is that land lasts forever. This means that people that could rightfully make a claim to live on the land include future generations. Let us continue the thought experiment. More years go by and the rich man dies, leaving the land to be divided equally between his children. Some of the children sell parts of their land to other islanders, and so on. 
After a few more generations, the land gradually becomes owned by more and more people. Say that we end up in a state where 10% of the islanders own land, whilst the other 90% are tenants. How is the situation now? Should society forgive and forget the actions of the evil man with the gun? Has the crime become so diluted and distant that there is scarcely any injustice remaining? The most common reaction you get from telling this tale is that it was all so long ago that you should just forget about it. Well, consider this for a moment. What if years ago someone made a claim to own the air around us and insisted on everyone else paying for the privilege of breathing the air? Say the air ownership licenses got passed down or sold through the generations and now 10% of the population could charge the other 90% for the privilege of breathing that air. Would you say let bygones be bygones and we should all just carry on paying the money? What's the difference? People need land to live on just as much as they need air to breathe. Consider the prospects for a newborn child of parents that don't own any land. Unless that child becomes rich enough to become a landowner itself, they will have to pay a significant fraction of their income to other landowning islanders for their entire lives. It's as if the crime was still continuing. Time and dilution of ownership do not fix the injustice. Instead, a kind of apartheid is created, with non-landowning citizens having to supply a continuous stream of money to landowning ones in perpetuity. The burglar has stolen your belongings and is now making you pay rent to have them back. This is essentially the world we live in today. In the real world, how do you think anyone got to own land in the first place? If you go back far enough, nobody owned any land. There was nobody to buy land from. Even in the most civilised modern societies, land only ever got into anyone's ownership by an initial theft. Some people may assume that this is the only way land and housing could ever be organised. But in the next video we will see, it doesn't have to be this way.